So, you know, there, I, I think maybe the kind of the, the, the overall temporal theme of the day, right, <laughs> is going from some of the earlier uh, history of the School of Computing to the more recent history <laughs> of the School of Computing. Um, and, but one of the things that I think hasn't been um, uh, mentioned a lot so far uh, uh, today is um, the history that the School of Computing has with networking. So, um, and the, the University of Utah in general has with networking. Um, so I, uh, um, want to, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll spend the next uh, panel uh, talking about that. Um, and, you know, of course, I can't go into this whole history, but we'll look at it through the um, contributions of a very specific uh, research group that I uh, co-lead, the Flux Research Group. So I'm Rob Ritchie. I'm a research faculty member here. Um, and uh, uh, I, I co-lead the group with um, Eric Eide, uh, who is here, and Kobus van der Merwe, who maybe isn't here. Um, and uh, um, and uh, we have uh, a couple of our alumni from the group. Um, both these gentlemen were uh, undergraduates uh, when they worked in the Flux Research Group. Uh, both of them went on to get PhDs at MIT. Uh, Dave Anderson is now a professor at uh, CMU, and Cody Cutler uh, is now a software engineer at uh, Amazon Web Services, the largest uh, cloud company. Um, let's see. Okay, big green button is the next. Got it. <laughs> okay, um, so I have just a couple slides to introduce this thing. You actually saw this uh, picture in um, uh, Steve's talk just a moment ago. Uh, it's actually on the poster over there as well. Um, so, you know, one of the, the history uh, uh, of the University of Utah networking goes back to uh, the ARPANET, which is generally considered to be the earliest direct predecessor to the internet that we have today. Um, so actually, uh, a few years ago, uh, in this exact room, we had a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the ARPANET. Um, uh, which this picture is in uh, 19 uh, uh, is the ARPANET in 1969, and uh, it's not you know it's a little bit of a hard to read picture, but you can see there that Utah was actually the first uh, uh, part of the ARPANET that was outside of California. So fourth node, first one uh, outside of California. Um, so you know, and, and none of us go back that far, right? But the point that I want to make is that this is something that Utah has always been at the center of. Um, so, um, uh, so where Dave and Cody and I come into the picture um, is uh, with the Flux Research Group. I started here in the late 90s, Dave in the mid 90s, I guess, uh, and Cody's, Cody in like the 2010s. Um, and this is a, uh, 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 a research group that is within uh, the Collard School of Computing. I've got a couple of pictures up here of the members of the group uh, through the years. These pictures are usually, uh, I think, maybe all bowling pictures. It's our animal, uh, annual uh, uh, um, uh, uh, holiday activity. Um, but uh, uh, we've had something like, uh, I looked it up you know, the other, night, the other day in preparation for this, uh, the other day uh, about something like 150 uh, people have actually gone through uh, this research group over the years. Um, and, you know, I can't uh, really talk about the Flux Research Group without talking about Jay LaPro. Uh, so Jay is the person who founded this group uh, in the mid-90s. Uh, it grew out of the, f the, the facilities uh, group for, the, uh, um, for what was then the Department of Computer Science. Um, and uh, uh, with funding from DARPA and HP, uh, um, and uh, with the early um, uh, uh, collaboration from Bob Kessler, another giant of our department, who uh, um, uh, who you know has was around for many, many, many years. Um, uh, uh, Jay founded this uh, Flux Research Group, um, and many of the original members of that group are still here. Some of them are in the room with us uh, today. Uh, and Jay led this uh, um, group until he passed away from cancer in 2008, uh, 15 years ago this year. Kind of amazing that it's been that long. Um, so, but you know, the group is still here, still working on the stuff that he started. Um, Jay had uh, uh, creativity and energy uh, that basically you know, nobody could keep up with. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, you know, was, one of the, was the founder of one of the uh, um, uh, main uh, conferences in our area, OSDI, uh, the, uh, which is the, um, uh, the, has a best paper award now named after him. Um, and, 
you know, the most fundamental thing that I take away from, you know, my time as a student of Jay's, I think actually has come up like in a bunch of the talks today. Some of the quotes that Telly Whitney um, had earlier about kind of um, supporting uh, uh, people to kind of do their best work without limitations. Um, and so Jay was somebody who was very excited by the work uh, that he um, did and was very, you know, he, and he deeply believed in the people that he was working with uh, and, the, the, um, and, you know, and, and, and deeply cared about them. So, um, you know, uh, uh, one of the great ideas that Jay had was, um, you know, uh, it's really nice actually to go after uh, Steve for this because Steve talked about how the, the availability of resources. And, um, you know, in operating systems and networking, uh, it's actually really important to have access to servers that you can reprogram and break and networks that you can reconfigure. Um, and so uh, 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 the Flux Research Group had built up uh, some infrastructure like that on its own. And the truth is that actually lots of other people need this infrastructure. And so we have uh, one of our major activities since then has been building uh, test beds for the networking, operating systems, cloud, uh, cloud computing, database uh, um, uh, uh, systems, right? So in 1999, we started building uh, Emulab. Um, this uh, was basically was operating um, a multi-tenant, remotely accessible data center with reconfigurable networking and storage. And if that sounds like a cloud long before the cloud existed, that's ex pretty much exactly what it was. Um, so uh, uh, it has gone from something that was literally assembled in the hallway of MEB. <laughs> Those of you who are around uh, to the, the, at the time when the, the terminal hallway was in MEB, this was the terminal hallway uh, assembly. This is a, the, the first assembly party in uh, 1999, I believe, uh, assembling uh, uh, hardware. Uh, to something that now runs in the University of Utah state-of-the-art downtown data center. Uh, as a globally accessible resource um, that's used uh, by people uh, um, all around the world. Uh, the way I just have went into the uh, Wayback Machine and took a couple of screenshots of our very one Web 1.0 1 original uh, uh, um, web page. It's kind of evolved uh, a bit through the years. Uh, but that original kind of vision of building uh, something that is, um, uh, uh, you know, a, an infrastructure for computer science researchers has branched out into building uh, ones for pow uh, the powder test bed, which is a, a, a wireless uh, um, uh, test bed that actually uh, covers a large amount of this campus that we're on now. Um, the, the Cloud Lab test bed, which lets uh, uh, experimenters come and build their own clouds. Uh, and it was a major part of Genie, uh, which was a, the National Science Foundation's um, uh, 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 like worldwide programmable network test bed. Um, so speaking of worldwide, um, this, uh, you know, people have been using these facilities, uh, not just here at the University of Utah, but uh, this is a, ma a recent map of our users, um, you know, in just about every U.S. state and in a large number of countries uh, all around the world. Um, so with that, I'll kind of move on to, um, yep, I'll leave it here, and I'll move on to uh, talking to our uh, panelists here. Um, so if I could get um, each of you to start kind of, um, Dave, first maybe talking about when you joined Flux and what you were doing when you first joined. Absolutely. Um, it's great to be back, by the way. Uh, <laughs> thank you for inviting me. Uh, so I joined Flux in about 99-ish or so. I had previously been a very delinquent biology and computer science student here. Um, I apologize to the biology department. <laughs> um, I founded an internet service provider called ROSNet that some of you may have used if you were not using my much more successful competitor, Xmission, which was also formed by a University of Utah alumnus. <laughs> um, but I decided I'd had enough of the real world and I wanted to come back to do academic stuff. Um, and Jay LePro was nice enough to kind of take me under his wing and let me hang out as a research, well, an undergraduate researcher and then a research associate for the year following when I graduated. Um, what else Excellent. do you want to know? Yeah, how about you, Cody? <laughs> Let's see. So I, I actually started um, my undergrad education at UVU down in Utah Valley, obviously. And um, I was kind of getting bored of computer science, actually, at that point. And I realized that um, I was going to switch to the math major, but then decided that I would also attempt to go to the University of Utah instead. So I actually transferred up here and was so stunned by the quality of the first CS class I took that I um, decided to remain CS. And in order to fund my education, I had to also get a new job because I moved up here. And I first went to the Cade lab to continue my IT work. 
Um, and turns out they weren't hiring, but they directed me to the Flux Lab. Um, and uh, we met and things obviously went pretty well. Um, so I ended up working there and uh, started with a very interesting project that ended up turning into um, a paper that kind of jump-started me into heading to grad school eventually. Excellent. Um, so, uh, so Dave, you were here when the uh, uh, when Emulab kind of was really getting started. Um, I actually looked up your first uh, commit to the source <laughs> tree last night. <laughs> oh, <Lord. laughs> um, uh, it was uh, uh, about uh, divert sockets in FreeBSD, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but I wonder if you can kind of tell me a little bit about kind of what problems that building, the, it was originally called the testbed for many years before it actually got a name, uh, Emuli, but I wonder if you can uh, uh, tell us a little bit about like some of the, the problems that the testbed was built to solve. Absolutely, um, and I'm gonna complain here, which is that I apologize. It's hard following a graphics talk. I once had a DARPA program manager <laughs> say to me, Dave, I don't ever want to see another ping demo in my <laughs> life. And here I'm going to tell you about building <laughs> ping demos. And so the way this all started is we had, in the Flux group, Jay's group had assembled this test bed of machines in this, in this back closet. And it was this under air conditioned, overheated room of like these beige PC boxes that they would use to do all of their operating systems research. Um, they were working under a bunch of contracts from HP on the venerable HP UX Unix system. Um, they did some work developing successors to the mock operating system, which you may know as the thing that actually underlies OS X. <clears throat> um, and then there was a, a whole bunch of follow on work with the, uh, the infamously named FL projects, um, which Jay's name, of course, Frank LePro, wouldn't have anything to do with that, but it was the Flux group, the Fluke operating system, the f or the Fluke microkernel, the uh, Flick IDL compiler with Eric and all of these things. But as operating systems projects, right, you have this problem. And the problem is you crash your operating system and the machine is just gone, right? And then you have to walk back to the lab and you have to push the button. And then you walk back to your desk and then it boots and a minute later, it crashes again because that's the nature of operating systems mm -hmm. research. And so it was a really good way for people to get their exercise walking to <laughs> and from this machine room, but it wasn't particularly good for productivity. <clears throat> and the way the, the Emulab actually got started was the annoyance of having to manage this cluster. So the first thing that happened before I got there was there were remote power cyclers for these machines. So you could click a button and it would, or run a command line, and it would reboot the machine. But then it would reboot the machine into possibly the same broken state that it was in when it started. And then you had to go and push some buttons again. <laughs> um, so one of the first things that we added, and this was, this was probably, I think this was actually my contribution, was a little kernel image that you could boot remotely that would copy a new image onto your disk. And if you were in the cloud world, you could think of this as initial provisioning of these machines. And so that operating system onto the disk loader then was one of the, the stepping stones we took towards this. And once we had that, we had this cluster that, hey, we can, we can load an arbitrary image on. We can copy free, we liked FreeBSD and things back then. Um, <laughs> Linux, for those of you who are modern, we can copy Linux on there. We can copy whatever on there. <clears throat> and then networking people said, hey, well, what about what about using it for my network stuff? And so we added these things we called delay nodes, which were you could route through another computer and have that computer add arbitrary sets of network delay or loss. And that was this, this FreeBSD deferred sockets. And so it kind of built up organically from the needs of what the researchers in the operating systems and network group were doing um, as far as, as being able to test their systems in a kind of user scientist friendly way. Um, and then it, it, it kind of took off. <laughs> and so uh, to, to follow up a little bit on that story, so this is about when I joined the Flux Research Group. Um, and uh, um, the, the, you know, originally we had a cluster of 40 machines uh, that actually hosted in the same uh, uh, machine room in MEB. Steve Parker showed the picture of the big giant SGI machines in. Um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, we started opening it up kind of more and more to, you know, the friends and then the, 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 the world uh, kind of at large. Um, and one of the interesting things about building infrastructure like this is that it has, it actually like brings up 
research topics of its own, right? So, Cody, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the work that you did um, uh, with respect to uh, uh, securing our bootloader. Sure. And, and yes, you, you can use the word toodles to refer to it. This is it was TDLS and toodles is what we call it. For sure. Yes, thank you for doing that. Otherwise, <laughs> So the acronym for this project that we started is TDLS, as he said, it meant um, the Trusted Disk Loading System. Um, and the, the problem that we were attempting to solve and eventually solving to some degree was that um, uh, if you allow arbitrary users to use these um, testbed nodes and not just use them you know, uh, at, a, at a high level, they actually get full access to them. They can do arbitrary things to them. If they're sneaky, they could hide perhaps uh, code that might interfere with other people's experiments or perhaps worse on these nodes. Um, and so, and this is not a simple problem. It's not just code sitting on like a hard drive or something. It, it's also code that's embedded into the network card and perhaps a graphics card and elsewhere on the PC. Um, even the very first piece of code that runs, that actually turns out it's mutable in some cases. Um, and so trying to make sure that all of these other potential vectors to um, attack somebody's experiment, um, make sure that it, it's safe and they have not modified and they're all in a good state, that was the, the point of this project. And it turned out, um, and I'm sure not by chance, there was a new piece of hardware that had just become commodity at this time. <laughs> Um, called uh, the TPM or the Trusted Platform Module, which turned out to be very helpful for this particular use case. Um, yeah, so it was mainly building this thing, and uh, an awful lot of effort was in figuring out, figuring out how it actually worked, because it was kind of, as I said, it was somewhat new then. It was a commodity, but there was no useful way to program it, so we had to do a lot of reverse engineering to figure out how to actually make it work. Um, and another interesting aspect of this project was that this, this TPM in the, the common use case, like when you use it on your laptop or on a phone, um, the boot, boot order is much simpler than what we had running in Emulab on the network nodes where we would boot to the network and then have to go through multiple other stages before we finally got to the thing that uh, the person running the experiment wanted to actually run. Um, yeah, I think those are the uh, salient bits. <laughs> and actually, if, if, I, if I can build on that. Yeah, um, please. For some odd reason, you have a person from AWS here and a person who spent <laughs> four years at Google here. And I can say that <laughs> this problem of securely reestablishing your hardware environment is foundational to both AWS and GCP's ability to provide hardware. And, and Jay's group was somehow tackling it in the early 2000s before either of these things was a, a glimmer in their mega corporation's eyes. <laughs> That actually leads really uh, great to the next thing I was going to ask you guys about, which is kind of um, to talk a bit about what you guys have each done since you left the group and how the kinds of, you know, skills you developed here at the University of Utah have kind of been a part of that. I'll start if you don't mind. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> um, let's see. So I, I actually visited um, uh, the operating systems class this morning and spoke of a bit about this already, so I, I have my answer already for you guys. <laughs> Excellent. Um, let's see, so specifically uh, from the Toodles work, the, that was one of the rare opportunities where you get to do a bunch of bootloader hacking, which I think uh, opportunities to do that outside of the operating system class basically don't exist for the most part. <laughs> um, and this knowledge would end up being super useful later in graduate school when I uh, ended up building an operating system for, for my research. Um, but then also, uh, believe it or not, uh, at AWS, at the service I work on, EFS, the Elastic File System, um, writing assembly there has also uh, been pretty important for some performance cases. Um, so as far as general assembly competence goes, that aspect was useful. Um, and there, of course, I'm glazing over some um, other details here about um, other aspects of setting up the hardware in a secure way, which I probably um, can't talk about anyway. Um, uh, let's see. And I guess after that, after my undergrad, when I uh, did my research project uh, for my PhD, um, that project, the, the point was mainly to show that you could you could build an operating system kernel that had reasonable performance in a garbage collected language. 
And so a lot of that work was on memory management. Um, and again, in um, another way that unfortunately I can't go into a whole lot of detail about, that has enabled other uh, recent um, project that we are working on, on in the service now on the storage side. Awesome. Go for it, Dave. Awesome. Um, well, I went on, I did my, I was part of this Jayla Pro to MIT pipeline that included me and Cody and Brian Ford and Austin McKinley and a whole bunch of other uh, former Lipruffians from Utah. <laughs> um, so I did my, my PhD on, on resilient networking. How can we make connections across the internet more robustly? And the weird thing was, this was a problem that I picked up at Utah. Um, one of my collaborators uh, <clears throat> lived in Corvallis, Oregon, and he had relatively crappy internet connectivity. And there were a couple times we observed that when, his name was Lee Stoller, um, <clears throat> when Lee He's would- He's watching now, by the way, I'm sure. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Just what we need. Uh, hi, Lee. Uh, <clears throat> um, so when we would, Lee was unable sometimes to connect from his house back to the Flux group. But, I still had machines at this internet service provider that I, I helped create. And I would let Lee go to my machines and hop into Utah and it would work, which <laughs> makes no sense at all, right? You're like, the network is working, everybody's internet seems happy, and yet you can't go from point A to point B. And somehow five years later, that turned into my PhD dissertation. Um, <laughs> so thank you, Lee, wherever you are, you, you inspired it all. Um, but, but no, I, I think my, my following career, actually, you could copy paste half of what Steve Parker just said. Um, so one of the first things is that I, I believe strongly in real working code, which is something I picked up from Jay. Um, and the second thing is that performance per watt has come to dominate my life. Um, and I have absolutely nothing to do with graphics. I took Pete Shirley's graphics class and it was astounding. And I can't multiply a matrix to save my life. Which is funny because I spent a bunch of time helping with machine learning uh, frameworks at Google too. Um, but really I can't. So I'm a systems person, but performance per watt matters everywhere. Um, because Dennard scaling ended, right? Dennard scaling was this thing where as we shrunk our transistors, we could reduce our voltage, which meant, which meant we could reduce our power. And when that stopped, it meant that we had to find other ways to become radically more efficient. And that's mostly been through parallelism and through even worse, vectors, <laughs> right? As a systems person, you're like, how do, vector math, how do I use vector math to help people open their files, <laughs> right? That doesn't seem like the kind of thing that we do. Um, and so starting in about, about 2008 or so, when these trends became apparent, um, I, most of my research has been focused on this question, and a lot of what I've looked at is the question of memory efficiency. Um, because it turns out the things that eat power in a computer system are <coughs> CPUs doing lots of math, and RAM consumes a fair amount, and moving data is deadly, right? Moving data from one place to another. That's why we have all these caches, we have fancy graphics RAM, because data motion is really expensive. And so a lot of what I've, I've done, Steve Parker could also have advertised to you, <laughs> because I steal ideas from my theory colleagues. I'm not a theoretician, I just poach their ideas, and I try to take them into practical systems contexts. Like, how can we build hash tables that use substantially less memory? How can we build database indices that use substantially less memory, and things like that. So the, the same driving factors that Steve was advertising to you all are the same driving factors that, that actually have, have been the core of my research for the last 15 years. It's really fun. <laughs> Um, so actually, uh, so I think another thing that I like to, uh, to ask you guys the, to expand on a little bit is, I think we've talked a little bit about how some of the work that was done kind of early on in Flux is now just kind of what the networking world looks like, what the cloud and data center worlds look like. So I wonder if you can uh, kind of comment on some of those things uh, that you might have seen in your time here uh, that just are kind of part of the, 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 the way that we expect the computing world to work now. Please go ahead. Well, I was going to say his secure bootloader <laughs> and configuration system, right? I, I, I mean, it, in many ways, what was happening in Flux presaged half of what you see in cloud, right? We had distributed file systems, which you had to use to access the nodes. We had secure bootloaders. We had conf reconfigurable networks. Um, like one of the examples uh, was something that a, a colleague of ours named Chris Alfeld worked on. He went to get his PhD at Madison, I think? He got his PhD at Madison in math. <laughs> in math, yes. yes. Right. So he was the opposite direction. That's right. That's um, and then he came back to computer science and works at Google now. <laughs> don't, don't we all? <laughs> Um, which was this, this problem of test, we called it the test bed assignment problem. 
And it was you've got a cluster of hardware resources and you've got a bunch of user demands like, you know, uh, person A wants five machines connected this way, person B wants six machines. How do I map that into my available pool of hardware resources without stranding lots of hardware? And this is a problem that Amazon and Google and all of these other providers have to deal with daily. And by the way, I'll mention, so, so Chris started that, Dave worked on it a bit, and then I got my dissertation from it. So thanks, right. guys. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. But, but actually, all of the problems that they had to deal with in some way are mirrored at radically larger scale, so the <laughs> solutions differ when you when you go into an Amazon or a Google yep. context. And you can probably tell more tell more honestly about how much the solutions <laughs> actually apply. Well, I mean, unfortunately, I, I, I really can't. Like, <laughs> uh, I, I would love to give a better example of how it could work, or you know, the work that could apply at yeah. uh, EC2. But um, like the Toodles is. Probably the the only good example I can think of. <laughs> All right, excellent. I was just thinking, have you ever thought of being on Saturday Night Live? <laughs> we, Dave was just asked I'd, if he would like to be on Saturday Night Live. I'd get, I'd get booed <laughs> off the stage. <laughs> um, let's see. So uh, um, I, I wonder if you guys could comment on kind of the the way that kind of the ava availability of um, resources for to, to do your networking and operating system work on how that is kind of you know enabling of I don't know the ability to do anything in systems <laughs> yes okay <laughs> it really is um, no to give an example when I when I went to grad school one of the things I had to do for this robust networking project was I had to have points all over the United States and the world where I could measure what was going across the internet and whether it was reliable or not. And nothing like that existed, so I had to build it. And I, I used a bunch of my connections from my ISP days. I was like, uh, hey, can I send you a machine? And you just put it on the network? And bizarrely enough, people said yes. <clears throat> and then I realized I had this test bed of like 20 machines out there that I had to maintain as a grad student. My advisor was very, very forgiving, um, bless his heart. Um, and so I did what anyone would, did, did, would do, which was that I turned to these folks and I said, can you please help me? Let's make this a test bed that you maintain and that I can use. And they crafted, actually it was this little CD-ROM that we then right. mailed out to all of the hosts of this network test bed. We even we handed said, them out at conferences. Right, can yeah. you just stick this in a machine and it will re-image our machine and now it's maintained by Emulab and we can actually make everything work. Um, and grad students today come to expect that capability, right? They're like, I need to do some networky stuff. Let me load up Emulab and pull up a dozen machines all over the world and I'll do some file transfers and everything will just work. Um, and it, it's, it makes the lives of grad students a lot easier now um, <clears throat> so that they can have hard things other than that to focus on. Yeah, I was gonna on. say, it gives them, hard, it gives them <laughs> other, hard thing, other hard problems to right, work they on. They can focus on the important yeah. parts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. I personally was not a network, I didn't do a lot of research in networking. It was mainly, a, like I said, on operating system kernels. However, um, and you know, building a kernel doesn't necessarily require building a topology and experimenting on it. Um, however, early on, I was uh, doing re research on performance of distributed systems. And that was probably uh, the main way that I ended up using Emulab, despite the fact that spent a lot of time building Toodles and other features for it before then. The main way that it helped me do research was I was actually able to run realistic performance experiments for this, this, this research project. Um, so it enabled that. It ended up not having a great research impact, unfortunately, but um, you know, it, that's the way cookie crumbles sometimes. <laughs> so I think maybe to get us back on time for our, um, for our, uh, uh, um, for our key next keynote, I'll just ask you guys one more question. Um, so, uh, so first of all, I want to say a lot of members of the Flux Research Group are actually here in the room today. So I wonder if like the staff and students could stand up really quick. Come on, looking at you guys. I see you guys. I see you guys. Uh, stand up. Okay. Um, <laughs> so thank you. So, so to the students who are here, right? I wonder if you guys could, you know, if you have anything you'd like, any any recommendations to make um, to the. Uh, uh, you know, the people who are now at their point in their career that you were when you were here in Utah, in their research careers. Uh-oh. 
I don't think, I'm not sure I, pre I'm not sure I prepared them for I was, the fact I was, that I was I was not this. prepared for this. Okay. Um, and so what I, what I can do is I can point back to Steve's list again, because okay. it was actually Excellent. a really good one, right? Which is, you, you need to find a supportive mentor. Jay LaPro was an amazing mentor. Um, but so were Pete Shirley, right? Mm -hmm. So was John Carter, right? These, these people were all incredibly supportive, and I would, Right. It feels really weird to be this kid from Utah who ended up at a big name university. Um, and I, st I, I still feel like that kid from Utah. And it, it's thanks to Jay and John and, and Peter and, and Al Davis with whom I, we, we co-taught each other networking for a while. I'm surprised you stayed in networking after taking the course. I did not know how to teach. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know how to learn. <laughs> so, um, but the, the mentor part is, is awesome. And finding a, finding a driving problem that really grabs you, right? Uh, I found it personally, and this may just be me, really important to find a problem that, that it got me, right? This problem of, of Lee Stoller not being able to connect to Utah. It was like, why? This is wrong. <laughs> this is, it wasn't just like wrong, it was morally wrong that the internet was not working for him. And I was willing to then dedicate the next five years of my life to solving it-ish. <laughs> In an academic sense. <laughs> um, and, and then do pay attention to these really long-term fundamental technology trends because they are, right, they are radically changing the way that research and the, the production actually happens. Right? Performance per watt is dominating everything from a systems perspective. Right? Moore's law, I call it Moore's zombie now. Moore's law is <laughs> dead. It's still kind of shuffling around. Right? We have a couple generations of ASML giving us, uh, now they call it extreme ultraviolet, I call it soft x-rays to make it sound a little more scary, <laughs> right? But as we, as we can, it gets harder and harder, right? Things will get more and more expensive. Um, <clears throat> so all, looking at those long-term technology trends so that you're not doing something that's gonna be a dead end. I think if you can combine those, if you're lucky enough to be able to combine all of those things together, you're gonna have a really fun time. And I'll just plus one the mentor advice. Like, had I not stumbled into Flux and met Eric Eide, Mike and Rob, and worked with them and the other colleagues at Flux, my life certainly would have been much different. Um, like, they introduced me to research and encouraged me to, um, you know, go to grad school and find interesting problems to work on. So, um, they, it was a great impact on my life. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, sir.